Welcome to the talk show, Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields in academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. Actor, stuntman, and motion capture artist, Chuck Johnson is our guest today. Chuck will talk about his incredible martial arts experience, as well as his action-packed career in movies. Chuck Johnson, welcome to Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. Mark, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. Chuck, how did you first get interested in the martial arts? Okay, um, basically, I'm I'm from Detroit, um, and I was the kind of kid in Detroit that that you know, like I'm not going to say I was shy, but I was the kind of kid that was easy to push around, right? So you know, I mean, I had my experiences with bullying and all that, and then when I was about like. 12 years old, I discovered Jackie Chan movies, right? And then I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're telling me like somebody systemized fighting? There's like whole systems of this stuff and you can like learn it and everything. So then I got super obsessed with it. And then, you know, I mean, I, that was back in like the VHS days, right? So <laughs> like, yeah. take the tape, put it in, plus rewind, sit, watch it and be like, you know, like following along as best I could. And then I did that for a few years. And then once I was in high school, once I was in high school, I moved up to the Lansing area. And then um, my my best friend was Korean. And he was taking one of my other friends in for a trial lesson to do Taekwondo. And I was like, well, if you're going to bring him, then I want to go. You know, so then I just went with them. And then six months later, I was the only one that was still doing it <laughs> out of the three of us. So and it was just it was the first sport I was ever good at. Um, it was the first thing I ever really grabbed on and gravitated to. And I was it was the first thing I was ever a natural at. So that, that's how I got into it. That's great, because uh, it's nice that, that Jackie Chan was an inspiration to you. And a lot of people see things on TV and they don't, you know, they think that uh, Karate Kid changed that with, oh, it's all aggressive and it's really supposed to be about defense and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I know that you mentioned bullying and, and as a former educator and a person who trains people at camps and even corporations. Anti-bullying uh, is, is needed so much because not everybody has the skill set that you have. So what have uh, you seen with bullying, both as a youngster in school and as a, a martial arts instructor and somebody in that field? I think the most interesting thing about this, coming at this from the perspective of somebody who was bullied themselves, and then coming at this now from the perspective of somebody whose responsibility it is to teach people how to handle that, is that there's there's different kinds of bullies right you know there's there's some kinds of bullies that will mess with you purely because they see you as an as an easy target you know what i mean just like the fact that like lions generally don't hunt tigers right <laughs> they don't do that they see somebody that's an easy target and then they'll go after you so half of teaching people to be ready for or to protect themselves from these situations is is teaching people how not to give off the energy of an easy target, you know, meaning how to speak with a strong voice, how to make stri strong eye contact, not be afraid to tell people no, not be afraid to stand your ground. Because a lot of times, like those kinds of guys, like they don't actually want to fight. They just want to establish dominance over you mm. and they just want to dominate you. So if you show them that you're not easily dominated or heaven forbid you actually knock the crap out of them, then that's it. And they're done. Right. Because they just don't want that. Right. Yep. And that's like half of the equation, right? The other half of the equation are people that have just been through a lot of really bad life experiences themselves. And then, you know, in their minds, they're always the victim, even when you didn't actually do anything, but they perceived you as doing something. So then they have, they, you know, they, they have to, to have their justice or whatever. Right. So, and in the case of these people, it's more all about like deescalating. You know, and then kind of just being like, well, you know, listen, like, can we talk this through or like, you know, what what's the reason for this? Why is this happening? You know, I mean, you still have to be strong enough so that you can't let them push them around. But oftentimes with those guys, if you show them that you're not actually a threat or that if you did something, you didn't do it on purpose or whatever, then, you know, then they'll actually be cool about it. Right. So a lot of the self-defense situations I got out, I got out of was taking that approach you know or for example you're at a bar and then like 
you know, you bump somebody who had a beer and then they spill the beer on themselves or whatever. And then they get to huffing and puffing their chest. And you just say, hey, listen, man, you know, that was that was my mistake. I'm sorry about that. Didn't actually mean anything by it. And, you know, I'll stand my ground. I'll step back. So if I have to hit him, I will. Mm -hmm. But I'll give him every out possible to just de-escalate and just be the good guy. And then, you know, a lot of times people will. Right. That, that's such an interesting philosophy because I remember there's different sides of the spectrum. Years ago, I saw uh, Chuck Norris on a talk show and they said, what's the best self-defense? And he said, run. He said, there's nothing wrong with running, that kind of thing. But when you mentioned standing your ground and, and people do give off that victim or target aura, uh, it's, it's also interesting because I saw uh, a special once on police being trained in verbal judo, because you opened up mm -hmm. with, you know, stand your ground, but, you know, an authoritative voice, because it's true, they really don't want to fight. What they want more than anything else, when I do anti bullying they want an audience, which is why sometimes we train the audience how to make it so they don't sit and, and, and like they're waiting to see a good movie about some bully beating somebody up. But mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you, I, I love the fact that we teach people how to not give off, you know, the, the idea that they're easily dominated. So I think that's great. But, you know, that, that that's really important because when I've done bullying training, when I train uh, people, Chuck, and anti-bullying in corporations, uh, it's the same bully he was when he was 11. He's just older, a little fatter exactly. sometimes, and just some more power. So, it's, you know, it happens in schools uh, and, and all over the place. So not just with exactly. students, with like with, with, with sometimes administrators and teachers, teachers and teachers. So I love that philosophy that you have. Let's go back, though, years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talked about also uh, being bullied. I remember I took judo years ago with Kata Watanabe, probably mm -hmm. almost 50 years ago. Loved it and just loved the uh, the aura of it, the, the philosophy behind it, uh, the whole way he taught classes, which I find martial artists – some instructors teach with so much respect that it's it's all about the respect for the art. But one day I flipped a kid who was one belt higher than me and I went to school the next day and I thought I was amazing. So that's just in my head. It was only like 10 minutes I felt so amazing, whatever, but I really felt really cool. But I think as a teen, you became a martial arts champion. So how do you keep your head on straight? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, thing, about, the thing about fighting is that, fighting always keeps you honest, you know, and that's, that's one of the reasons why you don't find very many arrogant fighters who are good. You know what I mean? Most, I mean, there are some, there's a few guys, right. But most guys, but even then the guys that are extremely arrogant, that's because these are guys of just extreme talent, right. Just naturally. Right. But most guys that become fighters that become really good, you know, they've gotten the crap beaten out of them before. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter how good they are, they know they're only, you know, one punch away from being knocked out or, you know, they're only one inju injury away from the end of their career. So, I mean, fighting is really humbling, man. And like oftentimes when you see the guys that are really good, they'll just be just the sweetest people in the world. You know, like there's no you can't, you know, I mean, if you let your your head get clouded and you get caught up in your own arrogance, that's when you get lazy about training. You know, and that's 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 when you start getting knocked out, you know, and that's when you're done. So you just you just have to keep, you know, your head on straight and keep your head clear and objective about the people that you're getting to step into the ring with. Sure. And and, and when when people take martial arts, they don't always make it well known. But once you become a champion, I mean, when you went to school, I mean, was it uh, did everybody know that Chuck is uh, an expert in the martial arts? I mean, everybody in, in school knew I was a Taekwondo guy. Like every, that was like my thing. I was like the Taekwondo guy in my school. But, you know, I mean, I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't like uh, try to walk around with like my medals on or anything. Right. <laughs> you, know I mean? you know what I mean? Like if people asked, then I was proud of it. So I would say so. But other than that, like I was just, I tried to just be like another kid in school, you know? Sure. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting question. I, I never thought about how how anybody else in high school perceived what I was doing with Taekwondo. Oh, sure. So, but I, but come to think of it, I think by when um, I think when I became a junior Olympic state champion, I was already either it was either the the summer summer between high school and college or I was already in college. Right. So I was already at Michigan State. So I think at that point when I had my first big win, you know, I was in a school of 40,000 or, or mm. more, right? So nobody knew who I was anymore. 
<laughs> just 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 my friends and family. But I mean, I had a uh, uh, I had a pretty solid competition record, local competition record leading up to that. So I guess in high school, people knew I was pretty good. Well, well, you know, a lot of professional boxers and and, and the, the the lay people don't really know this. That when uh, it may be true of celebrities, actors, and whatnot, but a lot of uh, professional fighters, MMA fighters, boxers, of course, martial artists, they have to travel with bodyguards because they're always one step away from some someone taking one or two too many drinks and thinking, hey, I got to take on the champ. So yeah. uh, so there's also that. Has that ever entered your life? I mean, there have been times where people would try to start stuff with me purely, especially because I live in Japan, you know, um, well, I'm not going to say especially because I live in Japan, but, uh, you know, out there. You know, especially in, in my younger days, uh, you know, I was a lot bigger than people. So there's guys that would that would specifically just want to challenge me just to see if they could challenge me. I remember I had one friend who was a he was a Japanese national shoot boxing champion and he knew I was an American national taekwondo champion. So the first thing he did is he challenged me to fight in front of all of his students. Right. Mm. And I'm like, man, if you want to spar, we could we could do that without all your students watching. Right. Because mm. that means either out of respect for you, like I got to lose or, you know, I got to beat you up in front of your students. And I don't right. want, you know, I don't want either one of those things. Right. But what I told him is I was like, he was a shoot boxing guy. I was a Taekwondo guy. So I said, all right, well, let's do this. Let's just make it even. Why don't we box, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then we just box instead. And then just purely out, out of the fact that I've got way longer arms than he does. And our reaction time is about the same. I just never let him in. If he came in, I would just jab him and just jab him. And that's all I ever did. Right. So it was a really kind of boring, uneventful fight where right. he couldn't get in. And he said, oh, okay, well, yeah, whatever. And then we all just blew it off. Right. Right. So, but I mean, that, that, that does happen. You mentioned movement and I'm so interested in that because uh, I know you do fight choreography and, and, and yeah. so except for not actually hitting the person, how is fight choreography different from actual fighting? And what's this term? I've never heard this before until I did research on you. Motion capture artist. Okay. Okay. So starting off with the difference between fight choreography and regular choreography. The big difference is that, or fight choreography and real fighting. Fighting is dynamic, right? And it's completely unplanned. And basically it's, it's two people working their way through chaos. You know, it's the best way I could describe real fighting is, is it's like chess at 10,000 miles an hour Ooh. right so you you know you step into a ring with another person he has a certain set of tools you have a certain set of tools you know and you have literally seconds to figure out how to use your tool to defeat his tool or how to use your tools to work around his tools right and then you're doing this but naturally it's a very chaotic process which means that it's actually kind of ugly right mm -hmm. the reason for fight choreography is to take this naturally chaotic thing and then to make it beautiful and to make it smooth and clean or to tell a story because sometimes fight choreography can be really messy looking as well but it's messy for the sake of telling a story about the narrative between these two people and why they're fighting personally with the way that i choreograph i strongly strongly believe that a fight has to be a story in and of itself with a beginning a middle and an end and then like character arcs where these you know these two people start this one thinks they're going to win you know, then this one realizes that they can actually win and like, and, you know, uh, the care, there has to be an emotional process that these people who are engaging each other go through. And there has to be stakes and character arcs and all that within the fight itself. Um, so basically, I guess fight choreography, as best I could describe it, is it's just a very, very physical style of storytelling. It's storytelling through fighting, I guess. Is the best way I can describe it. Yeah, and then also, besides in your brain, this is how I want the fight to be choreographed. Then you have to train the people, the actors who are in the fight scene to bring your vision to life. Yeah. And the thing that's interesting is that different fight choreographers will choreograph com in completely different ways based on just how they learn to shoot and then based on what their own martial arts background is. Mm. Like, I'm, I'm a Taekwondo guy, so what I tend to do the stuff that I like to make tends to be kick heavy, you know, whereas nowadays um, it's much more about MMA and, and jujitsu and groundwork and things. And that's the current trend, you know, um, but there's all, then there's also like the, the, the whole like close quarters combat stuff and there, and 
you know, the born identity type stuff. And there's all these different spheres within spike choreography and all these different styles, right? So it's just, it's a fascinating space to operate. The thing that I like about it in contrast with other stunts is nine times out of 10, you're not going to die doing fight choreography, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to get bruised. You get bruised, you get a little bit beat up, especially if you have to hit the dirt, if you have to do wrecks or you have to hit the ground real hard, mm -hmm. which is just a part of, I mean, that's what makes it exciting when you see somebody get slammed on the ground and you're like, oh, right? <laughs> so yeah. when you do fight choreo compared to other stunts, you get beat up more. But you get bruises, but that's basically all you're going to get is get bruises, right? Whereas, and it's really tiring and it takes all day. Whereas if you, for example, you do a high fall off of a building, your job takes literally two minutes. Right. You walk away with thousands of dollars. If you hit the target, great. You just go home totally fine without so much as a bruise or a scratch. You miss the target and you die. Mm. You know, and then it's the same way with like fire burns and, and some kind of, car stunts and things like that right like those all the high profile stunts it's super good money and you're, generally your job is done in like five minutes mm -hmm. but if it goes wrong you die <laughs> right so that's that's the thing that i think makes fight choreography interesting and why i like operating in that space so you know as, and, as, and, and as a and as a motion capture artist another term for a fight choreographer a motion capture artist what that is is um that's for video games or for you know uh computer generated projects for cg projects right when they need realistic looking animal movements or human movements for example in video games if they try to just create a cg character and make it walk then it's going to look really choppy and unrealistic so it's easier to just take a real actor and you put sensors all over their body and then you record their movement and then you just hire an actor to be a voice actor and then you put the sensors on their face and then you record their facial expressions. So that's something that I got into in Japan because, you know, if you look at entertainment in the States, our number one cultural export is our movies and our television. You know, right. it's it's right. Like everyone in the world watches American TV and movies. Right. If you look at Japan, their biggest exports is like video game and manga. Their movies generally don't really go abroad. You know, if they do, it's in a very, very small scale. Right. So that being the case, I mean, you can do motion capture work in the States, but it's it's just, it's it pales in comparison compared to doing films in the States. Whereas in Japan, mocap work is kind of where it's at, you know, because that's those are the projects that go all over the world. If you say, oh yeah, I did DJ in Street Fighter VI, everybody knows what that is. Mm -hmm. You know, and everyone's like, wow, you're in Street Fighter? That's amazing, right? So for Japan, you know, motion capture work as an artist is just some of the best work that you can do. And it's some of the work that pays the best because those are the biggest international projects. Right. So, yeah. You know. That's so interesting because uh, a lot of people don't know what goes on because on my show, I always talk about the story behind the glory. Look at all the work it takes. And people say you play a video game. And they they love it. They don't know what goes into it. But you mentioned the film industry. And as, as I do say, we talk about the story behind the glory. So I know you have some exciting things going on. What struggles did you have as a producer uh, of your first feature film, Eastbound Traffic? So this has been Eastbound Traffic. It's, it's still in pre-production. We're getting ready to shoot in October. And up until now, I can say with an honest heart, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And everybody says that about making feature films like before, because I went to because I've been working in entertainment for 22 years now. You know, I know a lot of producers. And then I said, I'm going to make a feature. And I was like, Chuck, are you sure? Are you are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure? Do you have any idea how hard it is to make a feature? And I was like, well, you know, I mean, I've made four or five really, really successful short films. And they're like, yeah, but bro, the difference between doing a short and a feature isn't like it's not like, you know, uh, a short is like five points and a feature is like 10 points. It's like a short is five points and a feature is a hundred points. Mm -hmm. It's a huge difference. And the reason is because when you're making a short, you know, you're not making it to sell it. You're making it purely for creative expression, right? So the goal isn't to sell it. So whereas when you're making a feature, because you know, the teams get exponentially larger, you know, like you need like a lighting team, you need a producing team, you need a sound team, you know, you need your script supervisor, because the scale of it is so big. 
that means you need a ginormous amount of money, mm. which means in order to not lose that money, you know, you have to sell it, which means all of a sudden now you have to think about marketing, right. to think about who your target audience is. You got to think about distribution. And then because you have to deal with all that stuff and because you have to, you know, get money from investors and like a large sums of money from investors, that also means you have to think about all of the legal aspects, which means you have to hire like a production lawyer. You have to pay, well, you know, are we going to use a U.S. production company versus a Japan production company? And if so, like, you know, how is the payouts going to work for everybody? And then, you know, what's going to be the payout for investors versus producers? And like, it's just it's in, it's a massive, massive undertaking. Whereas with a short, it's just the creative side, you know, mm. but for the feature it's the creative, which is still super important because that's what people are going to buy is your creative product. But then you also have, you know, the, 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 the sales aspect of it or the business side of it, plus the legal aspects of it, you know, and that's where, that's where most, you know, feature directors fail is the second too, because going into it, they don't, they just don't know how to do it. Nobody knows how to do it your first time. Right. And you, you just have to figure it out. And it's like, it's like trying to build a ship um, to sail around the world when you've never built a boat before. Hmm. You have to build the ship and then you have to finance that ship. You have to finance the building of the ship. Right. Then you have to build the ship. Then you have to gather your crew, which is going to be, you know, 20 or 30 more people than you've ever worked with before. And you have to make sure you get good people who aren't going to be a, the rest of the crew and who aren't narcissists or psychos or whatever. Right. Um, you know, and then and then you have to build this boat to sail around the world. And then you have to sail it around the world yourself yep. when you've never sailed around the world before. And that's what making a, your first feature film is like. It's wild. It's a wild process. That is, that is, sounds like the definition of the story behind the glory. It's definitely yeah. not as easy as people think, but it makes the reward that much more worthwhile. So in closing, I have to say, Chuck Johnson, thank you for joining us today and sharing your experiences as a martial artist, a producer, motion capture artist. Uh, to the viewers, don't forget to watch us on E360, available on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. EST, available on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire. Remember to follow us on social media. Life Stories of Mark Hoban is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and of course, our YouTube channel. So subscribe. Chuck Johnson, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you too, Mark. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. To contact Mark, email him at info at lifestorieswithmarkhoberman.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman.